Good evening, everybody. From Hong Kong, it is an evening anyway. And I'm here with Kenneth Chu for a lively conversation about the Meng Deshuang collection. But before we even begin with that, let us please look for briefly at, we do have some housekeeping rules because we're online. So all participants are automatically muted. We do have questions. We welcome your questions. So please ask those questions in the Q&A box. Speakers will answer, Kenneth and I, will answer at the end of this talk. Simultaneously, interpretation is available in French, Cantonese, and Mandarin. To use that feature, please choose from the icon at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, and you see the icon in front of you, the black mark for interpretation. Through the Eyes of a Connoisseur is an exceptional chance for us this evening to learn what it means to be a connoisseur, how to look at the features of art, history, antiquity, and all of those things. And to do that, we have here with us, and a very big welcome to Kenneth Chu. Yep, thank you. Thank you. It, was, it is an honor for me to join you for the conversations and hope that we could share our experience and our joy of connecting with the audience here. Definitely a, yeah. a shared joy yeah. uh, from art history point of view, from collecting point of view, from jewelry yes, point of view. Yes, absolutely. This evening's conversation is divided into three parts. So we would like to kick off starting about the psychology of collecting, really probing what is the motivation behind collecting. And when we get that as our foundation, then we'll move into reimagining the mm -hmm. past, looking at the pieces and what they tell us about history. And the third part is only you can do it, and Betty Lowe, the co-founder, and you're the spokesperson this evening, is through the eyes of a connoisseur. Yeah. How you see things in okay. a way that the audience is going to learn how to see okay. this evening. So the three parts. And to start, we're going to talk about the psychology of collecting. And we're paused here, Kenneth, with just this one image, without even looking at any art of, of the pieces mm -hmm. in the collection. So can you talk us through a little bit about why would you begin collecting? What is your motivation and objective? Mm. The thing we talk about psychology is seem to be very scientific. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, for me and my, uh, my wife, Betty, we, you know, we together start mm -hmm. the Moon Deshuang collection. I think, you know, to start off, we need a dream. Yes. I think the dream is very important. You know, if you don't have a dream, you cannot start your collecting journey. So with that dream, I think it's a passion. Mm -hmm. You have the passion to learn, you have the passion to, um, to, to collect. And that really is the driving force. Okay. And so that's with the key motivation. The key motivation. And then I think it's the hunting spirit. Okay. You really have to go out to hunt. <laughs> you have to go outreach. You know, you, but with that hunting spirit, you need to have um, aesthetics. You know, you have to yes. train your eyes. Yes. You have to equip yourself with knowledge mm -hmm. about what you're going to buy, what you're going mm -hmm. to collect. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and after all this, I think the important part is sharing. Okay. Sharing with the public, sharing with the scholars. I think it is the psychology that I think mm -hmm. if you, if you sort of speak of psychology, is what we enjoy our collecting journey. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you've really opened up to us what's in your mind. Absolutely. And yeah. what now we'll be able to see how that translates okay. to actual <laughs> objects, okay? <laughs> Here we have in front of us looking at the magnificent installation at Le Col School of Jewelry Arts mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very clean line, modern line. Absolutely. Um, and Kenneth, can you tell us what we're sort of seeing here? This is the art of gold, 3,000 years? I think the idea actually come, uh, come from Nicole when they have the chance to visit one of our exhibitions in the past. Mm -hmm. So they, they are really f um, fascinated by the gold collection that we had. Yes. And they talk about trying to um, showcase some of the pieces to illustrate the manufacturing technique. I see of okay. the ancient gold ah, okay. artifact. So um, they have spent uh, quite a lot of time to, s to choose from our collection about mm -hmm. 
I think it's 55 pieces. Oh. Try to illustrate the four process, yes. you know, four manufacturing process, the hammering and chasing. And in fact, I, we see in this image on the didactic yes. panel, the teaching panel, yes. uh, it's the panel that's dedicated to hammering and chasing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think, you know, what we like about, you know, the, you know, the philosophy of uh, the Co-40 particular exhibition is they want to um, put in a very strong education factor. Mm -hmm. They want mm -hmm. to educate, you know, the viewers, the public about, you know, the manufacturing technique mm. of engine gold. So they focus on four areas, as I just yes. mentioned, about, you know, the hammering and chasing. Yes. Um, the casting, yes. uh, the filigree, mm -hmm. and uh, and wiring, mm -hmm. and also the granulation. Mm -hmm. So, so I think you know they choose from our collections uh, artifact that help to illustrate this four process and, and can be used in jewelry manufacture. Yes, absolutely. Gold. Yeah. Okay. So your bringing us to this point is your psychology of collecting, the collaboration with Le Col. And one other particular thing, which is how you style your collection mm -hmm, name. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you prefer to retain the transliterated title, which is, and my pronunciation may not be perfect, yeah. forgive me, but it's three Chinese characters. For anyone that's joining us, uh, we see an image on the, in front of us on the screen. Uh, it's read from top to bottom, and it's three Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. And those three Chinese characters the first two about the butterfly dream, if we put it simply in translation, is actually a very, very famous story yeah, strong from Chinese philosophy. Yeah, from Zhongzi. Right. So can you yeah. tell us a bit about that, Kenneth, please? Well, I think um, uh, we, uh, Bet, you know, Betty, my wife and I really liked um, the, the name of the collection because mm -hmm. I think, first of all, the name itself is very romantic. Mm -hmm. The dream, butterflies, you know, sure, it's, it's beautiful sure. dream and, you know, beautiful uh, romance. So um, and then of course you know the philosopher Zhuang Ji is very yes. famous. You know, a Taoist philosopher. Yes, you know yes. this is a warring state philosopher. The story, mm -hmm. very briefly, is talking about Zhuang Ji. One day, you know, he in a dream, he dreamed of a butterfly. Okay. And then when he woke up, he he was not sure that he was actually dreaming a butterfly or he was in a dream of a butterfly. Yes. So uh, the story itself, of course, very romantic and very philosophical. Yes. Yes. It's in a way actually a some existentialism mm -hmm. uh, idea. But you know, for us, you know, we like this because you know, not only about you know the romance. To us, we think we are not sure about you know whether we actually are owning the collection that we okay. had. Yes. Or, or actually, you know, the the collection is you know is have chosen us as the owner. Oh. So so that's this a is wonderful a concept. interesting so interesting uh, concept. Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, the dream and the butterfly. Yes. So yes. Uh, for us, uh, we think that we are only a custodian. Yes. Of the okay. collection. Yes. Of the pieces that we collected, and uh, and when we pass away, mm -hmm. you know the, the the artifacts will continue to to survive mm -hmm. and to pass on to other mm -hmm. other collectors. Mm -hmm. And actually, when they come into our hand, they may have already been in the hand of other collect well, yeah, collectors absolute, for many years. Absolutely. So and we are only temporary custodian. Okay. So I think this is the idea that we have that you know we you know we like this uh, name of the. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and on the screen, we're actually, we've provided uh, an English language translation, which is, is actually, I think, one of the nicest translations, yes. descriptions, uh, which actually was published in the 1940s. But I think what, just briefly, what that shows is that this kind of dream, this butterfly dream and the philosophy is, has actually existed, the concept for thousands of years, yes, right? Yes, and it's, yes. it's as relevant today um, as it was then. And when you say the pieces come to you, they may have been with someone else, that kind of thing, that you're the temporary custodian yes. is, is a wonderful way to look at it. And when we look at the foundation of your collection, apart from the name, we can also look at three pieces that mm. sort of signify where did you begin, where are you now, and what's your aspiration for the future? Yeah. Could you guide us through, Kenneth? We've got three three pieces. Uh, this is actually a very simple uh, uh, explanation of the evolution mm -hmm. of our collecting journey. Yes. We start off our collection actually very much inspired by my father-in-law, ah, Betty's uh, father, father. Uh -huh. who was a collector. You know, a very yes. traditional uh, collector of Chinese art, mainly in uh, Chinese jade mm -hmm. and porcelain. Mm. So he actually, you know, the first picture you know on the left you, you can see is a bronze mirror. Right. It was a bronze mirror that he bought I think data back in 19, 1976 or so. 
-hmm. <coughs> this is a very um, um, exquisite design with exquisite design bronze mirror. He bought it at that time. It's very rare to find a bronze mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly at that time, you know, what he could find on the market are jade and porcelain. Yes. Very difficult and very rare to find a piece of okay. uh, ancient bronze. I and see. this is a piece of ancient bronze in the Han Dynasty mirror that he bought. So when you, when you say a mirror, what we're actually looking at is we're looking at the design, for, um, we're not looking at the polished yes. underside, which yes, is yes. the mirror. We're looking at this yes. side, which is where it would be, there's a little loop in the middle, yes, right, yes, to yes. hold it. The loop it. is for the, put, putting a piece of string. Yes, to hold, hold the mirror. You no, know, the, okay. actually the mirror is on the other side. Yes. The front part is actually the, the design okay. that you know, they, they use to decorate the mirrors. And it has mystical animals, patterns, yes. designs. Yes. So he bought the mirror in 96 and then he gave it to us as an anniversary gift. Ah, oh, um, I see. Maybe about, you know, uh, in the early, in the, in the late 70s. Yes. So when we received the gift, we were really intrigued mm -hmm. by the design of this mirror. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. only about a 16 or something like 16 mm -hmm. uh, centimeters okay, mirror. So not very big. On yeah. this, on the, on, the, on the front part, you could see actually amazing design is they have about an in inscription of more than 30 Chinese characters oh of goodness. a poem. Wow. And then they have, you wow. know, in, the, in this very small area, they have four song. Yes. And each song has about, you know, uh, two mystical beasts. So mm -hmm. total about eight mystical beasts. Mm -hmm. And then with a lot of other design, like the throw design and yes. some zigzag design. So on this piece of mirrors, on this small size, you know, you could find that uh, the craftsman at that time put mm. a lot of creativity mm -hmm. sure. and a lot of manufacturing skill and, yes. and casting skill yes. to produce a mirror of this design yes. and so sharp and also crisp yes. um, uh, uh, casting. Design, yeah. so, so with that, you know, we were then very impressed uh, by the uh, bronze mirror. And then actually that is how we started to collect bronzes, so then Chinese from, bronzes. And then from with. bronzes, when we, we you a couple of words you said about craftsmanship, technique, technical skill, and so on. That would lead us into something that is in gold, but equally refined in technique Absolutely. and craftsmanship and Absolutely. so on. And this is actually why we learn about uh, metals and actually mm -hmm. how we start to uh, collect ancient metal with the bronze, um, uh, which yes. bronzes that we start. And from that onward, we have the opportunity to come across some ornaments, yes. uh, metal ornaments, gold ornaments, and right. silver ornaments. And then again, you know, we were very impressed because you know of the of the workmanship mm -hmm. of particular gold because mm -hmm. gold are so precious, mm -hmm. so precious. At the same time, they are they are very close to you to to the to the wearer. Sure, because you're wearing. You're wearing. So, so you have to put. You know, or they must. They must buy or they must have it made into very intricate, exquisite design. Mm -hmm. And this is how actually then we develop into uh, collecting gold. And this is the so second the, part. Okay, so the middle one is actually something in the current exhibition, yes. correct? Yes, yes. And wh what stands out to you about this, about the technical craftsmanship? This, um, this actually is, um, is a pair of gold hairpin mm -hmm. uh, of Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And they are amazing design. You know, they are granulation. Right, and I on can top see the, the little, the little you have, dots. You know, all these, yeah. you know, seven type of uh, uh, gemstone and glass, mm -hmm. and also uh, a shell. So, and and on this um, uh, granulation, actually, it gives a kind of a matted effect. Sure. So to highlight um, the gemstone setting, mm -hmm. and they are actually wonderfully made. And you can see, you know, the the sort of workmanship on this pair of. Um, uh, have been a really amazing. And this is this is this kind of close up really helps us yes, understand yes. that. And then going now, I see something similar in the next image of actually a a, a jade uh, scabbard or sword. Yes. I I also see gemstones, but I see jade in there yes, too. Yes. Could you explain and what jade what, also what, some metal? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's I think that's the key point is the metal because yes. that is this the direction that you're yes, now headed. Yes, you know from gold and then you know we. Um, we continue to pursue our interest in uh, metal work. Yes. And yes. Uh, I think, you know, now we are getting very much um, fascinated uh, by the workmanship mm -hmm. of the Central Asian and Asian uh, 
workmen's on mm -hmm. arms. Mm. For them, you know, the in, you know, particularly this is the interest of my of Betty. Yes. You know, she really very um, impressed by the workmanship they put on producing uh, salt. Yeah, I see. Uh, innate, you know, for them, you know, um, the salt is actually more for is a status of rank, mm -hmm. like the fashion accessories sure. that we have. Yes. The status and rank. So they are more than just weapons. Yes, understand. You know, they, they are the representation of the status, the status. of the wearer. Right. So this is a piece of jade, you know, um, huge yes. um, salt. Yes. There's a lot of gemstone in it yes. and made by the, Mo uh, the, the Mughals, Mughals. No, in the 17th so it, century. It's, it sounds that you definitely haven't stopped collecting. It sounds like it's a lifelong passion. <laughs> the journey continues. Okay, anyway. the journey continues. <laughs> and, and with that, that remark about the journey continuing, perhaps we'll now take a little, a little break and uh, we'll look at the past, if okay. that's all right with you. Yeah, sure. So reimagining the past. We, we want to look a little bit at the cultural and historical context mm -hmm. of the current exhibition, uh, The Art of Gold. And to do that, we'll just orient ourselves a little mm -hmm. bit because we're talking about China. Now, we know what China's geography is today, but in the past, it was somewhat different. So this is uh, actually taken from the catalog that comes mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. exhibition, right? Mm -hmm. And it takes us through certain dynasties, Shang Dynasty, Han, Tang, Song. And you, you have pieces ranging throughout this yes. whole period, don't yes, you? Yes, the 55 pieces actually <laughs> range from Shen Dynasty okay. all the way to, to Qing. Yes. But mostly, you know, in, um, in the Tang and earlier period. Okay, so we're yeah. talking about, say, the 7th, 8th, 9th uh, centuries, then mm. onwards. And then if we move a little bit forward in time, we've got the Yuan Dynasty, Ming Dynasty, and Qing Dynasty. And correlating that to the maps that we're seeing, we're just seeing how the territory, how the geographic expanse mm -hmm. of China changes. So that's going to mean something for your collection, I'm yes. sure, <laughs> about how, how the geographic boundaries move and expand. That, that will inevitably affect what comes into your collection. And an excellent way to look at that <coughs> is to take one place. And we've isolated that one place as mm -hmm. Dunhuang for discussion purposes. Mm -hmm. Because Dunhuang was on the Silk Road, which was an, a fabulous interchange. Yes. Silk Road of, from the east, from the west, exchange of, of craft, yes. technology, yeah. ideas, aesthetics. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. And then what happens in respect to your collection then is really the important point. So what happens in your collection is we have a place, say, like Dunhuang. So again, an orientation, we're on the Silk Road, we have caves, we have uh, an inbuilt temple. But what's most important for our purposes is mm -hmm. what's inside the cave. And if we take just one illustration, this is a reproduction yeah. of a Tang Dynasty. You, you've mentioned Tang Dynasty mm -hmm. a couple of times already. Mm -hmm. That's a key collecting area for you. And would you mind walking us through this type of illustration of why is this illustration relevant to your collection? Sure, Please. yes. Thank you. I think, um, talk about Dunhuang, I think Dunhuang is not only the gold mine of Buddhist art, and actually this is also something like an, a thousand years of histories of fashions mm -hmm. uh, of China. Oh, okay. Okay. Because, you know, the cave started from the northern and southern dynasty yes. all the way down to Yuan dynasty yes. for 1,000 years. Sure. And in the caves, you know, like this, you can see mural like this, mm -hmm. you know. It's only, you not only, you know, talk, you know, illustrate, you know, Buddhists or some Buddhist, you know, uh, um, illustrations, but it, a lot actually uh, have images of the daily life yes. of yes. the people of that period. Right. And this is actually talking about, you know, some, something like a, a uh, uh, a court lady or a noble mm -hmm. lady, mm -hmm. you know, uh, on, on a sort of um, picnic or whatever. I think she's a, she's a donor, right? Donors, in one right? of the caves. So as you can see her head do, yes, you know, with yes. a lot of ornaments, yes. you know. So, so, so you illustrate the kind of fashion, the kind of ornaments that they have mm -hmm. in these particular murals. And then what we're, what we're seeing is actually, you, you mentioned, Kenneth, about rank and status. So what we can see from this illustration is that the, 
the lady at the very front of the procession wears the most elaborate headdress. Yes. So that's going to have the most gold, the most inlay, the most granulation. And then behind her are her two daughters, yeah. who as women of younger age wear less extravagant headdresses. Yes. Behind are the attendants. And what is so moving to, to me as a viewer of this and having seen mm -hmm. your collection is that pieces in your collection were actually worn like this. Yes. So yes. the granulated piece of the Tang Dynasty yeah, is... So it could be one of those. Could know. be one of those. Yes. We don't know. We're not yes. saying it yes. is. Yes. But having this visual evidence that is incontrovertible, it yeah. confirms yeah. how these ornaments yeah. were, were used and worn. And, uh, and that's why I think you know, the Zhen Wang caves are important in a way because there are about 500 cases there. Mm -hmm. More than half of the cases actually uh, are, were, were, were built and, and, and built by the Tang Dynasty yeah, uh -huh. donors. Yes, yes. So that's why in, inside this cave you could see a lot of uh, illustration images that mm -hmm. could illustrate the sort Fantastic. of uh, fashion and to, accessory. To help us attire. understand, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we mentioned earlier it's the Silk Road, which is this. Oh, gosh, it's such a, an amazing interchange of cultural okay. ideas. And we have a slightly different kind of image here, um, reproduction of a, of a cave mm. uh, painting from Dunhuang. And this particular culture is a Silk Road Kingdom, the Cotonese Kingdom. Yeah. And these ladies have a, a slightly different type of, of headdress and ornamentation and facial makeup, yes. of course, and costume. So. Uh, I can't believe the actually the extravagance. I'm, if we consider the middle image, that's some kind of amazing phoenix in the headdress, or mm -hmm. possibly turquoise. Yeah, yeah, I don't turquoise, know what you would yeah. think of that. Turquoise or glass. Actually, I think it is something like the Five Dynasty period. Mm -hmm. You know, this mm -hmm. and uh, these are Khotan people. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. This is actually one very interesting point because it's really well illustrated, sort of cult cultural inference in the cross culture yes. inference yes. during the uh, actually throughout from even from a warring state all mm -hmm. the way uh, to Tang and to Yuan mm. dynasty and onward so the cultural exchange and cultural the cross culture inference also have a big impact on the fashion on the right, fashion right. accessory on the closings on the accessory as well like you can see in the middle the lady I think is, uh, is wearing uh, uh, earrings for yes, example Quite so, so earrings <laughs> actually are not very Han Chinese, you know. In ah, the, yeah. I see. Earrings okay. actually, you know, um, even in Tang Dynasty, you know, um, uh, not a lot of ladies wear uh, earrings. Mm. Uh, but after Tang Dynasty mm -hmm. and actually during the the, the Neo Dynasty, mm -hmm. which could, could follow, also exist, yes. you know, yes. uh, follow the Tang, and uh, they start because the, the Neo people and the nomadic people had the tradition of wearing. Ah. Uh, earrings. Okay, so, so that influenced uh, yes. the Han Chinese. Yes. So you could see actually in the Song Dynasty, you know, the Chinese and the Han Chinese natives also start very start with this fashion. Yeah. So your collection is teaching us a lot about jewelry, a lot about techniques, a lot about cultural influences and trends and developments throughout Chinese history. Yes. The, we, we have an, another kind of illustration which was specific to is specific to this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And these are contemporary artists' interpretation, commissioned drawings to help us further understand how pieces may have been worn. Mm. So here on the right, we've got a pair of earrings from your collection with a suggestion on the left of how they would have been yes. worn. Yes. And actually, this pair of earrings is interesting because uh, this is Yuan Dynasty, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, they start wearing quite a lot of the ladies start wearing uh, earrings from the Song and onward, okay. all the way to the Qing Dynasty. And this is you can see the design is very non non Han Chinese. For sure. You know, this For is sure. like a paisley uh, leaf. Yes, or it the yes. Chechu nut uh, leaf uh, flowers the design shape, right. uh, with the beadings. Yes. And then inside are some throw design, and 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 again this illustrates a sort of cross cultural inference. Mm -hmm. You know, this could be um, sort of uh, influenced by the Islamic. Uh, design. Yes, yeah, you know, interesting. During the Yuan sure, Dynasty. In Yuan Dynasty with yeah. the Mongols. Yeah, the Mongols. Yeah. And if we would, would look at one other example, um, I think this is something that is less customary. An earring, for example, I can relate mm -hmm. to easily in wearing mm -hmm. an earring. Mm -hmm. This other piece, which is to me really exceptional in its use, is the cape weight. Yes. And 
it must be very, very helpful on windy days or when somebody's wearing a, a long flowing silk robe to mm. be able to keep the, the, um, the flow of the silk in a beautiful way so it's not flapping all over the place, basically. So we have two illustrations here. Uh, we have in the middle, of course, your, the gorgeous piece from, from your collection. On the left, we have a contemporary commission yes. drawing to suggest how it was worn. And on the right, we have an historical evidence mm -hmm. of costume and how the weight was at the, the bottom. So may I ask you, as someone who's not knowledgeable uh, about this, when you saw this, when, it, when you thought about acquiring it for your collection, did you know what it was right away, uh, a cape weight? Uh, the first piece may not. <laughs> and then a okay. the second piece go. I <laughs> okay. think as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, learning is important. You yes. know, you have to do a lot of research. I yes. think you have to, like, you know, you study the murals, you study a lot of other right. things. Then actually then help you to, to know, to, to understand what you are buying, mm. to know what you are buying. This is important. So you know, knowledge is Knowledge is, is important, yes. you know. Yes. I think you have to be an intelligent uh, collector, you know, right. Way. Right. because, you know, if you don't know, then, you know, of course, you have to, you may not know everything, mm -hmm. but then you have to acquire that knowledge. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think this is also the interesting part uh, of collecting, and particularly for uh, collecting ornaments, because mm -hmm. you really help us to understand the material culture of yes. China. Absolutely. And to, uh, to understand and to, to learn about how all these ornaments are, were applied. Mm -hmm. I think the fashion design at the time are really clever, as you said. You know, you I have think a, it's a great you idea. Weight, you know, to keep the cape in. in <laughs> in place. Yes. And then, you know, also you can see this piece is um, open work and hollow inside. Oh. So they may also have put in some herbs. I was just going to say, so some maybe some fragrance. Perfume, fragrance. Nice. So, so when they walk, you know, can, can, they could also have nice. the sort of great fragrance. And not right. only just, you know, the weight, but also have the fragrance. To, I, I have to tell you, I think that's a super sophisticated concept. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Highly sophisticated. Yeah. And that's why Cape, <laughs> Cape um, Pendant is very, very popular. Uh, from from Song Dynasty oh. all the way through the Ming Dynasty. Wonderful, you know. so wonderful! My goodness, I gee, I'd like one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you've, with that, you've 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 really introduced us a bit to how we're seeing it through mm -hmm. your eyes and your knowledge. So to continue on this theme, why don't we look at some pieces in your collection specifically, mm -hmm. and through the eyes of a connoisseur. And rather than, you know, the, the exhibition has decided, divided the material into technique, casting, hammering, mm -hmm. filigree, that. Mm -hmm. So this conversation is an opportunity for us to take a different approach. Absolutely. Yeah. Why don't we start with the animal style and nomadic mm -hmm. influence? And we see here a gold headdress ornament yeah. um, and could you walk us through a little bit with that? Sure, what are yes. we looking at, please? It is one of our favorite pieces you know, that uh, Betty and I had acquired many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. This is a crown of the Sungnu, uh, yes. of the nomadic tribes, uh, warring state. Early, 3rd uh, century BC. To, yeah, wow. to the 3rd century BC. Very early. Actually, you can see now it's hollow. Actually, it should have been maybe, you know, in the past, they may have um, the silk or some cloth mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. put onto the... Uh, Over the head. On the underside, on the side, you yes. know, on the head. This piece you can see the front part here is actually is a, is a big horn, the head of a big horn ram yes. being attacked on both sides by a, a, an eagle. Okay. And then the eagle, underneath the eagle, they are, they are grappling grab, a, 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 a snake. Oh my goodness. Oh. On the back of the, uh, of the eagle is a, is a, is a deer yes. on both sides. And then the deer was sort of attacked by a tiger. So it is a typical um, what do you call a, a animal combat scene? Um, combat, for sure. Very typical, for sure. typical of the design that the nomadic tribes. Because they would be seeing that, that every time, day, yes, right? Yes, it is the yes. daily observation. You could see actually the artists. You know, at that time, I really um, have very sharp observation of what the nature mm -hmm. is taking place mm -hmm. every every day, and this is the combat scene they have been yes. watching. The See tiger it chasing the, yes. So yes. they, but they captured it, translated it so well into a piece of art, into, uh, through but the gold, yeah. into, a, into a crown. So art, but very practical because it's an Absolutely. ornament, it's a crown. Yeah. And this, this close up in particular really shows us the animation Absolutely. of the, the chasing scene, of the, uh, 
of the combat of the animals. The animation is also actually, you can see, is very uh, lively. Mm -hmm. The deer actually, you can see, is in the recumbent positions. Yep. And actually, is ready to jump, but then, you know, being attacked by a tiger. Oh, yes, so yes. So you, 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 you could appreciate the sort of um, interpretation of the, of the nature. So you can, can really see the artistic input yes, there. Yes. Really, somebody carefully observing, Tra translating this animated, vigorous combat yes, scene. Yes. Very, that too, very sophisticated yeah. at that. Yeah. yeah. And that's why actually in, for us, we are particularly uh, 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 impressed by the animal style mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the nomadic tribes during that okay. particular period. So we can move on to, to another uh, uh, very, very, um, by comparison, simpler and smaller, but equally, equally compelling. And again, would you please take us through what we're seeing here? Yes, yes. That's why I said, you know, the, the nomadic artists, they really, they really very creative and they really uh, could translate what they see every day into a piece of art. Mm -hmm. You know, even in this case, it's like a round you know, okay, it's a yeah. round plot. Yes. Okay. Right in the middle, you can see, you know, it's actually, it's a donkey. And the donkey and actually is being attacked by 10 Raptors wow. or eagle, you know the, I can the, really the, see the eyes. Beaks. You know the your beak. You yes. can see there are ten uh, eagles at the time attacking it. So very stylized, but then very artistic. Very, yeah. very. You know, but in a way, if I might say, it 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 could be looked at as being rather modern because oh, it's yes. it's taking the element. So yeah. the eagle, it's not showing the feathers yeah. and the claws and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's taking the beak yeah. and well, stylizing in, in, in it. Respect, I think this sort of like animal art or, or the during the particular uh, period is really timeless. Yes, it is yes, timeless. timeless. Sure, yeah. sure. But timeless in a different way brings us to another theme in your collection, mm -hmm. which is the mythical style. Yes. And we've also categorized that as mythical style international influences. And to illustrate that, we can look at one piece, uh, which is a necklace with a pendant. And perhaps to get your um, eyes showing us what it is, we'll move on to the detail to focus in. So again, what, what are we seeing and why is it important in your collection, yes. please? It is, this piece is actually something like, you know, X entry mm -hmm. uh, time period, but it is, um, we believe is from the uh, ancient Tibet kingdom. Ah, uh, okay. Right in the middle, you know, it's a big belly, it's a yes. deity. Yes. And actually also with a sort of a, a, a third eye in the forehead. So he is holding on both sides. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is dragon fish, the makara. Makara, okay. you know, is, uh, is is the Indian Buddhism. You know, okay, makara. So it's, it's this word makara, M-A-K-A-R-A, makara. Yeah. So, so this this actually, you know, um, uh, this motif, this design, is not just in that particular period. Actually, is even in 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 dated back to Greece, and actually, in also in Central Asia, they have it. You know, like the same. Uh, motif, you know, is uh, they call it the sort of protector of animals. Okay. Uh, some holding dolphins, and some maybe holding a dragon. So in this in this very international style, we're actually looking at something from Rome mm -hmm. on what on one side of the screen, and on the other side of the screen, we're looking at something from Buddhist caves in Sri Lanka. Yes. And how amazing it is that that mythical animal, that mythical hybrid. Yes. Hy the yes. makara doesn't really yes. exist, yes. right? It's yes. a hybrid yes. animal beast. Yes. So we're looking here, if you could take us through, I think we're looking at the bottom of the, of the fountain. Yeah. So the figure emitting water and then dolphins on Dolphin. the side. Yeah. Okay. And then on the other side, <coughs> taking us across the world is a makara. We can't see it too, too clearly, but it is there. It's at the very top <coughs> of the sculpture in the middle above the Buddha's head. And it's another version of this hybrid dragon exactly. beast with water and, yes, and yes. remarkable, yes. remarkable. Yeah, remarkable. I think the necklace that we, we just uh, illustrated, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Tibetan, the ancient Tibetan necklace. So it's very much could have been under the influence of the Gandhara. Definitely, uh, the Buddhism. definitely, yes. And now, you know, and that, that motif, as I said, you know, is, was very popular in, in a lot of other cultures yes, as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. So really, really very uh, international from yes, that, yes. that perspective. And another piece 
also in this category of mythical mm -hmm. animals, mythical beasts, international influence, is this rather complex shape. It's a gilt silver pouch shaped ornament. And the key here from your point of view is really the symbolism of the animals. Yes, and also at the same time, I think this is also uh, under the sort of cross cultural influence. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is actually a pouch, not just a pouch, look the like, but this is a pouch. This is a pouch that actually you could see they could hang down from the belt, mm -hmm. you know, to put things, you know, to put some valuables, you know, on, okay. on the pouch. So on top, you can see the torso of two horses. Yes. You know, Chris has beautiful, beautiful mane. They do, they yeah. do. And then beautiful. you could see the horse look very determined, you know. And then underneath the, sort of the neck, uh, looks like, you know, uh, and, and the and then they have the saddle, the yes, saddle cloth. I see that. And, then and the belt kind in of the thing. Belt, you yeah. know, they very we find very exclusive very. You know, workmanship. Uh, and then underneath uh, two confronting unicorns, mythical beasts. Yes. You know, yes. Mythical beasts unicorn also come from the West, you yes, know. Yes, yes. They are they are not typical. This piece is actually again is from the ancient Tibetan kingdom, eccentric. Oh. So you you can see actually uh, this is Maybe it's a kind of the, 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 there may be a story mm -hmm. behind. There may be a mystical story behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, this is exactly we talk about the myths and yes. also the cross cultural influence of that. So when you let, let me ask about when you're talking about ancient Tibetans, so the workmen, the craftsmen were lo geographically located there. Could be or could, could be, be accurate. They may have accurate. This is also another cross cultural influence. It's also the. The, the exchange of the workmanship. Yes. And they could yes. be have they may have the um, workmen from the Sudan workmanship yes. or from Central Asia. My goodness. So so wow. uh, I think this is very international. Yes. You yes. Know, very international. That's yes. Right. Remarkable. Yeah. I, I would like frankly with each piece I'd love to ask you where and how you came across this piece. But before <laughs> we do that we'll we'll go on to uh, yet another theme that defines the collection, which is looking at floral mm -hmm. motifs, mm -hmm. foliage, and with an influence that's Mongolian, but also uh, very traditional in a way Chinese. And to illustrate that theme, we've got quite magnified. We're now moving forward. We're in the 12th to 14th century, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're moving forward in time. And we have a hairpin with flower and fruit mm -hmm. designs. Mm -hmm. Actually, you can see this one again. I think the the, the, the design and the shape of the hairpin is not very Han Chinese. Mm. So this is the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongolian uh, kingdom, and uh, we believe very much under the Islamic influence. Yes, you can yes. you could have a lot of um, feeling of uh, Islamic uh, mm -hmm. uh, architecture. Uh, so uh, this also talk about you know the sort of uh, influence by the other yes. countries as well. Yes. Um, the workmanship again, you know, is the filigree, mm -hmm. and it's so not that's very fine, very fine, very and fine. then again, you know, not uh, it was also imported, you know, from 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 uh, the, from a Western country, you know, from the Central Asia into okay. China. Yeah. So can we maybe pause a little bit for you to teach us uh, a little bit more with this image about filigree? So filigree and. Is it correct to say there's any granulation in here, or it's just filigree? No, it's just filigree. Filigree. This one, this okay. One filigree. Filigree. Actually, they have this um, sp special effect. Filigree uh, has actually a longer history, you know, in in Central Asia and mm -hmm. in, uh, in in the Western uh, part of uh, of China. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, they imported into it and become very popular. Starting to become popular in Tang Dynasty, mm -hmm. and I think it come to a peak uh, in the Yuan Dynasty. Yuan Dynasty okay. um, go. Uh, artifacts they have very impressive uh, workmanship on uh, filigree. Yes, yeah. and and Kenneth, with something that's so delicate like this, um, as a collector, are there any issues related to conservation and care, or uh, what, what happens when you collect art, the art of gold? I think um, gold is gold, mm -hmm. and uh, it won't be tarnished. Basically, it won't call. Uh, 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 you corrode. Yes, uh, yeah, corrode. So right. usually they are in very stable um, uh, situations. Yes. So um, I think the care actually compared with other things would be minimum. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have to observe basic what humidity controls or yes, just humidity, very Yes, humidity. But yes. you know, it's it's not unlike you know, it's unlike silver. Silver has a corrodes corrode a lot. Yes. And, and tarnish, yes. You know, yes. Uh, with strong you know high humidity. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. 
And this one we're looking at much magnified. So it's, it's really amazing to think that the artisans at that time were, were seeing it very magnified, could work on that level of detail and that yes. scale. Yes. Really, really very remarkable. And then there's something that the design is a little bit more robust, I guess mm -hmm. we can say, by comparison. Mm -hmm. And we move to a comb ornament with mm -hmm. gemstone inlay, moving mm -hmm. forward in time again to the 15th and 16th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. And by looking at a detail, we can get a better sense of this. And what are the, uh, the gemstones here? These um, this actually uh, could be rubies. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually, they, um, they're called a comb back. So they are not the combs for combing hair. They actually the comb back, they may have um, uh, bone or wood. Oh, okay. Uh, underneath. So the, it, they that's put gone on the hair for too. now. Yeah, they're the, gone off okay, now. That's gone, okay. So these are part of the whole hairdo uh, 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 ornaments. Mm -hmm. So they put on top of the hairdo, they mm -hmm. may have two or three, three or four, they put to adorn the head, oh. the hair, okay? okay. So um, this one is actually made by hammering, mm -hmm. but they produce very uh, high relief effect yes. uh, to produce uh, chrysanthemum flowers that stand out very uh, Okay, so this, this, this image shows us beautifully yes, the relief. Yes. Very high relief. They imagine, you know, they, uh, for the first of womanship, you know, for a piece of gold, they hammer into that high relief yes. and make, the, um, uh, make, make it very light. Uh, and, and thin, okay. so you won't have a lot of weight, so you know, when you put on the hair. Not too heavy to wear. And yeah. partic partic particularly this one, you can see the very fine uh, floral uh, uh, scroll design as well, all mm -hmm. along um, the chrome. Mm -hmm. And then on the on the on the end of the two uh, on the two ends, they are they are the design of a rabbit on each end. Oh, how uh, sweet! Yeah, <laughs> that's very sweet. <laughs> oh. and during this time period. Where would where would the rubies have been sourced from? This actually again, you know, we talk about you know as um, culture, yes, uh, trading as well. So for the Ming Dynasty, you can see the silk, um, the the, the, uh, maritime, the silk maritime silk road. Maritime silk road. Um, <laughs> they they brought you know they have a lot of uh, 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 expeditions. Yes, and yes. And they brought back you know gemstone like rubies, sapphire, sapphire yes. from like Sri Lanka or from okay. you know from oh. other countries. Yes. So that becomes actually very popular, particular mm -hmm. for uh, um, nobilities and the royal families. You know they adorn. Yes. So, um, Accessories, you know, the the ornaments with expensive mm -hmm. uh, gemstone. Remarkable. Yeah. Very beautiful. So we come now to auspicious style. Auspicious mm -hmm. style, symbolic importance that the wearer, the owner, would be imbued with ideas of good fortune, well-being, prosperity, mm -hmm. good health, all mm -hmm. of those things, which. Yeah are all very positive, yes, yes, <laughs> okay? Yes. And one example, um, which you're not, we're not exactly sure of the date of this piece, it's, it's a rather mm -hmm. wide dating period. Mm -hmm. It's a gold pendant with flower and phoenix designs. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, for the particular Han Chinese, you know, mm. they're very much uh, into symbols. Yes. Very yes. symbolic expressions, you know, in the ornaments. Uh, you could see it in the, in the, in the, in those uh, animal style mm -hmm. uh, uh, ornaments. Yes. They're only very simple. Yes. They just like depict, the tiger, the deer, yeah, they depict, the, um, the donkey, animals, the eagle. The, they, they, <laughs> they, they try to depict the comeback scenes, so they don't have uh, too much meaning. You know, mm -hmm. other meanings into the in the design. So starting actually now from the Ming, the Tang Dynasty, and then uh, you know, they they start to build in some design that they think they could. Represent something. Yeah, something more. Uh, simple. Right. And like, you know, for example, this one, Phoenix represent uh, royalty, yes. wealth. Yes. And then the Pioni also um, represent is a symbol for wealth. Yes. Okay. So, again, the symbols in the earlier days are more are more simple. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then going into uh, Ming Dynasty, you know, the symbolic symbols are mm -hmm. becoming more complicated. Yes. You know. Yes. Yes. Well, rich culturally um, have greater depth, greater meaning, gr all of these things become become things that we'd love to be surrounded yes. with. Yes. <laughs> okay. When men getting more sophisticated and then they try to make things complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of complicated, um, with this we, we actually come to 
of all the pieces that we're discussing in this conversation, we come to the finale, the finale piece, which is mm -hmm. probably the most, one of the most complicated in the yes. collection in yes. terms of being a, an absolutely beautiful synthesis mm -hmm. of techniques, of symbols, um, really quite remarkable. So we're looking at here, we're looking at a gold hair bun ornament with bats, highly symbolic, mm. dragons, highly symbolic, and over to you with your eyes, please, of what we're seeing. Okay. Uh, this is complicated also in terms of the manufacture. So they, um, <coughs> they have the filigree, they have granulations, mm -hmm. uh, they have wiring, you know, they have chasing work you know, on, the, on, the gold, on the gold surface. And then you know, they have um, the structures also, not just only a piece, you know, as, as a hairpin, but they have also the two wings on the side. Okay. Uh, Let's see if we let's let's see if we can get a a better sense of yeah, that yeah. with the it's the two wings. So the two wing on each on the wings, um, they actually try to highlight you know, the shape of the bun. Yes. And on each of the two wings, you know, they have a dragons. It's a five claw dragon. You know, five claws for Chinese it can only be the imperial. Imperial. Yes. Okay. So they must be the bun for the imperial uh, court, maybe for the prince, in you know, a small bun you yes. know, for the prince. And, uh, and, and interestingly, the dragon is uh, filigree. And yes. then, um, and, and very lively uh, 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 poise. Uh, and on both sides, they're chasing a framing pearl. Okay, mm -hmm. they're actually playing with the uh, framing pearl. So that's the one that we see that actually looks yes. a little bit red. Yes. The red one the is red. the pearl that represents okay. the frame and the pearl. The flame, and yes. And then the dragon head actually interesting. Each of the dragon head is made by a spring. Mm -hmm. So that means it become a uh, uh, it, it could sort of um, uh, uh, bounce a little bit when, when the wearer moves. Ah. Okay, it's three with the wound movement. Okay. So that means actually when it wear and people look at it, the dragon is something like dancing. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Wow. So, uh, it's and this is worn by a man. Yeah, wo and he's wearing his hair in a yes. top knot yes. or something yes. like that. So, um, and then the, the, the symbolic uh, meaning of the dragons you know, is, is the royalty, of course. Yes. And also, the, the deeper meaning is the two dragons uh, playing with the pearl is uh, is a represent of some virtues, the Chinese virtues. Yes. Uh, bravery. Yes. Beneficence. Ah. Being humble. Yes. And being gentleman. My goodness. Okay. And of course, you mentioned a lot of bats. The bats is meaning fortune. Yes. And also, yes. apart from a bat, there are also lotus. Lotus is a Buddhist symbol. Sure. Meaning, you know, it's sort uh, of purity, purity or nice, and yes. uh, sort of elegance. Mm -hmm. So this is very complicated in terms of the manufacturers, in terms of the symbols. Uh, and, 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 and there's a beautiful work of art. Of and and when, you, when you found this, acquired this, was it intact in one yes, piece? Uh, it's intact in one that piece. That must have been thrilling. Yeah. It is, uh, <laughs> must have been thrilling it, to on. find actually, it. Actually, this one is interesting. <laughs> I could share a story. Actually, please, please. I was traveling. I was not in Hong Kong. But Betty bought it in Hong Kong. So uh, she bought it. I, 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 was not, I was there when she bought it. <laughs> and uh, she told me about, you know, at this time we don't have uh, WhatsApp, you know. Sure, sure. So uh, she told me about a beautiful crown. So, and she described to me, and then, you know, as I said, oh, it's beautiful. And when I come back to Hong Kong and look at it, I was really stunned. <laughs> I bet. It was really stunning, you know. <laughs> I bet. So uh, I think Betty did a very good job. You know, Excellent. Got this one. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your insights you. to experience and and obviously for us to share in in a conversation with this we're actually taking from you decades of your experience yeah. and we're trying to concentrate it into a, a, a discussion conversation of, of half an hour or a okay. bit longer which is remarkable so thank you so much thank and you. we have also now we'd like to I think I'll le we'll leave the image here if we may okay. and we have quite a few questions okay. from the audience okay. so let's now turn the evening over into discussing some of the questions and undoubtedly they'll all be for you I'm sure <laughs> so I try my best please please all right so um, interesting question about the uh, about the Mogao caves in Dunhuang and the question relates it says why did they stop wearing earrings however I think what we were talking about was yes. actually beginning mm, yes. wearing could yeah. could you just remind us yes, about yes. that the actually time? earrings you know are not at that time not very popular um, uh, among the Han Chinese because okay. maybe they don't want to 
have the peers, you know, the, you know, you're uh, Chinese, they have the, you don't want to hurt yourself. I know, you I know, understand, yeah, from the Because it is from the yes. parents, you know, so, so this, this was what popular at that time, mm -hmm. you know. Um, during the, um, it's more popular at that time among the nomadic people. Yes. So the um, nomadic people in, during the Tang Dynasty are the, the Chitan. Yes. The Nel, later become the Nel, Nel Dynasty. Yes. So they like wearing earring, the men also wear earring, on mm -hmm. one earring. And they actually then have the sort of um, uh, influence, you know, okay. the fashion influence. Okay. So to Tang, the so Song Dynasty. Okay, so we're saying Tang. To put it in a historical context, we're saying Tang Dynasty, say, just roughly speaking, eighth, ninth century. Han Chinese were not wearing earrings. Uh, not so much. Too not much, so. Yes. These are general. <laughs> these are okay, <laughs> These are generalities. This is not a university yeah. exam question, yeah. but these are generalities. Yeah. So the Han Chinese people at that time, from what we know, mm -hmm. were not wearing earrings. The nomads were, and it could be because when you're a nomad, you're riding on a horse, and it means you've got to wear jewelry that stays on. Yes. <laughs> is yes. that, I mean, is that yes. too simple? And, uh, and I think, you know, at that time, I think probably the nomads, you know, they like to wear everything uh, with them. Right. So yeah, so you've got to have it so with you. So Perfect. With you. And that's why I could even, you see the Dun Wong K, for example. Yes. This one is um, something like the 9th century, 10th century. Yes. Uh, the um, the uh, uh, the um, they start they can see they have start wearing earrings. Yes. But the earlier slide, the earlier right. the, so the, the high tang, before the high tang, the, the court lady, before, they don't have the earrings. You can see. Right. Yeah. Right. So what a fascinating study in trends and and dating and so the on. Fashion evolution. Chronology. Yeah. Fa fashion evolution. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know we'd be talking about that this <laughs> evening. <laughs> Okay, um, so we have another question and specifically related to the image that we're sharing is were the hair ornaments uh, possibly, could they have been of bronze and turquoise, do you think? Good one. Do you think they could have been this one? Do you think this is gold or? This what? I don't know. I we think it's difficult yeah. to, to, mm. uh, to see from the picture because you know, you right. know the, the color on the cave, they change anyway. Yes. Yes. You know, they change a lot. You can and see some, some facial, they become dark, and actually they are not dark. Yes. They originally, they may have been, you know, they are white. Well, it's so you could yes. difficult, difficult see, they may be turquoise. Right. Uh, turquoise could be glass. actually could be glass. glass. And turquoise could be, could be, could be uh, quite close because, you know, at that time, during the Tang uh, dynasty, uh, Tang, Tang people may not have a lot of turquoise. But, but then Tibetans the, would. The, the nomads, they yes. like turquoise. Yes. Know, they like turquoise a little bit. So they could be, have been glass mm -hmm. or turquoise. Okay, yeah. so also on this, it seems that there's a lot of fascination on these, these particular illustrations uh, and the context of it. So the question also relates to social meanings of Tang Dynasty hairpins. Um, and the question is, could we have more information, please, about not only rank and status, but also about uh, bridal context m in marriage or uh, ceremonies. Uh, what about gender? So do you have any about hairpins, hair pieces? Ha hairpin hair actually, you know, they certainly, um, uh, for the Tang period, you know, they certainly use a lot by the ladies, by the court ladies, mm -hmm. and, uh, and not, to my understanding, they don't have a lot for that for the men. Okay, uh, at that time, yes. Yeah, but for the Song, from the Song Dynasty, because they ha they wear a bun, right? They usually have a cap, yes. and some of them have a hair pin sure. to to stick to make the, sure to make it's sure the, yes. to fix the position. Okay. Thank you. That's a, a great yeah. great help of whether you know it's gender based and yeah. it relates to hairstyles basically, exactly. right? In that sense. Exactly. Okay, so then we have another question about the uh, slightly different about is granulation an often used technique? Do you see it very often? Yes, granulation, yes. Granulation actually become more populous uh, during the, um, uh, the Han Dynasty mm -hmm. and then uh, in the Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on people what they really want to use in the right. latest way. Right, right. So sure. granulations uh, have a special effect of the shading effect. Okay. Oh, I see. You know, okay. when you have the granulation, yes. you know, under, under the sunlight or under light, you know, they may have different shading. Yes. Okay. okay. They give Got you it. the texture. Understand. You know, of yes. the gold rod, it's just a piece of gold. Yes, because it's not flat. Yes, it's not just, flat. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, a question that's very, very different, and I think 
hasn't been raised before, and it is fascinating. As I see it, the the uh, 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 our attendant the attendee is is saying. As I see it, you can read the pieces. Do you feel they have a kind of vibration to them? Do they have a soul to them? Certainly, I think when you buy this, you know, we do have a vibration. <laughs> okay. We, we, have, we have the liking. You know, we really yes. feel the sort of passion. You know, when you see something. Uh, so, so th there, there is a, um, uh, there, there is a conversation, mm -hmm. always, you know, between the piece that you know mm -hmm. that we and us. So, uh, uh, something in that piece that attract us, and yes. then we start talking to us, and then we start talking okay. with them. So you're talking about the piece actually, in non-verbal ways, yes, is communicating with you. Way. You know, the aesthetic, right. the aesthetic Beautiful. meanings, you know. Beautiful. So a lot of pieces actually has a lot of meaning, be it uh, the design mm -hmm. or the applications, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when I think there is one piece in the, in, uh, in the exhibition, but not illustrated here, you know, mm -hmm. there are two roundels, and, um, and we, we, when we first buy it, you know, we don't know exactly um, the usage. Yes. And then, then we find out that actually it is a kind of um, uh, uh, ornaments that you put on the back of the head of a man uh, when when they have two what we call it pigtail ponytails no Pig ponytail tails? actually is oh. uh, <laughs> is 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 is, is um uh, see the Iron Man huh? scarf not the scarf oh a no, scarf no, okay not a scarf ring yes okay. oh a scarf ring yeah. oh, so something okay. actually I think the, the process something sometimes we may not know. Yes. But then, you know, after you're quiet, then, you know, we start to study and then learn about sure. applications. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And just to, to further pursue this idea of the art piece speaking to you non-verbally, of course, the vibration, do you ever come across pieces that you get a bad vibra bad feeling from or they just don't interest you? Yes. Uh, I think if they are not interest to us, then we just pa pass. Pass, we just sure, pass. sure. But something actually that something interests us, then you know we uh, uh, we believe in um, uh, uh, what we call uh, in Chinese yu. Yun, uh, yes, yun fan, very important called, uh, concept. Opportunity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, I think, there th 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 is actually very interesting. Actually, there was one piece that we, uh, we it's not in this particular show, in the piece of gold ornaments that um, that. That one day when when we walk you know walk into a, an, an, an antique shop that mm -hmm. we used to buy from, and we saw the, um, uh, uh, the owner was packing something and uh, and Betty was asking what is it, so the owner was very kind enough to to open it and say you know this was sold but I want to let you mm. have a look, this is a piece of gold, uh, ornaments that you know with the rider, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a man on a riding in a horse, and then you know turning his back it uh, is. Uh, um, it was an arrow. Yes. So it's a beautiful piece that you know that we uh, that that really stun very stunning. Mm. So it's unfortunately it was sold. Mm -hmm. So um, but many years later we managed to buy from elsewhere. Ah. So so, so it came back to you. It yeah, came to you. Yeah. So so this is the core of the yes, fun, you. Yes. Yes. That's very. That's really really nice. Yeah. I like that very much. Yeah. So there's it has its destiny. Yes. Destiny, destiny. to belong destiny, to you. Destiny. Yeah. And as we're coming to to the end of our conversation, um, just to remind everybody that if you did ask a question and we're not able to answer it in this live session, we will, like call, will respond to you with an answer. Mm. And I'm afraid we have to wrap up already. Okay. Um, I'm, it's, it's, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you for your thank expertise. You. Thank you for yeah. your collection. Yeah, thank really you like for your sharing. eyes. Yeah. And as like call continues, uh, with a very robust programming, there are two more live upcoming conversations. So one is the secret language of flowers, and I think there's what there's undoubtedly there are more. But for the time being, um, here's your opportunity to register now for September for the secret language of flowers.